Hello, everyone. I'm Al Rochelle. We continue our series, and we want to thank you for joining us here on the Internet. We're going to talk about autonomic medicine in cardiology, and my guest is Dr. Howard Snapper. Dr. Snapper, thank you so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Give me a little bit of your background, your, 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 your bio, if you want to put it like that. Sure. Well, I'm an interventional cardiologist by training, and I've been doing general cardiology and angioplasty stents, pacemakers, and all that for many years, and then... About 10 years ago, I started getting involved in this autonomic medicine, so I took an interest in it because of the fact that there was um, so many patients who would come to a cardiologist with, with heart symptoms, but their um, testing would all be normal. Mm. And the patients would be very frustrated because they would have chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, dizziness, or fainting, and yet everything came out normal. So I'm pretty persistent, so instead of giving up, I kept looking and trying to find a reason for why they were having it, and ultimately I was able to find the cause, which turned out to be in the autonomic realm. Okay, so the the cause. Let's talk more about it specifically, if you could. Okay, so basically, a lot of this stuff, in the the most simplistic way, a lot of it is sort of adrenaline-based. Okay. So the sympathetic nervous system is is part of the autonomic system that produces our norepinephrine and our our epinephrine. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason that that, that system is firing, that causes a lot of different symptoms. For example, it will increase the heart rate, it will cause the patients to have palpitations where they're feeling their heart pounding. Yeah. Um, it can cause dizziness, it can cause chest pain, and usually it's not actual pain from their heart, but, it's their, but a lot of times it's actually their chest wall or their, or their chest itself is contracting because of the epinephrine and norepinephrine, and so they feel tightness and they think it's their heart when in fact it's, it's not a heart issue but they still feel that in in the same sense there's also difficulties with breathing um, and patients also have uh, issues with feeling they're going to faint or fainting Mm -hmm. because of all of this. And because if you watch TV or read in the newspaper, we're all told if you have any of those symptoms, go to the ER because you may be having a heart attack. That's exactly right. And a lot of those patients, we meet them a lot in in the emergency room because they do come to the hospital because of those things and we find them And we evaluate them, and a lot of times they get heart testing. And usually, whether it's in the hospital or back in the office, they're going to get a stress test, or they're going to get an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of their heart, or they're going to get some sort of heart monitor to look at their heart rhythm. And so many times, these all come back negative. Mm -hmm. And most cardiologists, you know, they get to the point where they say, well, it's not your heart, so I'm not sure what the next step is. And, and that's sort of where I got into this. Okay, so then let's, let's play this all the way out then. So then what is the next step for people, ER doctors, they go, we can't figure out what's going on? Well, the next step, first place, I think the most important thing is to not underestimate the patient. The patient is not making up these symptoms. And I think a lot of times um, healthcare providers in general just sort of get frustrated with the patient because they say, we've done everything, and it's probably just anxiety. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I call it just a four-letter word because it's almost like you're, you're talking down to the patient when you, when you say, it's nothing, it's just anxiety, and it's usually not anxiety. There's a lot of other things that play into this. Part, sometimes it actually is anxiety, but that's sort of the... Um, you know, the less common of the causes. Yeah, yeah. My son is an ER doctor, so he will tell you that when you look at the statistics, you have most of the people that are coming in that are being treated, besides injuries, are oftentimes being treated for behavioral issues or uh, psychological issues that may manifest themselves in cardiology problems. Absolutely. That is correct. So, how, so, so now we get back to the quandary of, well, then how do you take it to the next step? Because in the ER, it would be nice if you would go to your primary care physician, they would look at it. But oftentimes, people come to the ER and they say you don't have a heart attack well it still hurts so they go home and they don't do anything well at that point they have to go to somebody at least who has an idea of what the next steps are in evaluating the patient and then and then treating them right because there are many treatments but you first have to figure out what the patient has okay with autonomic problems then we've talked about the next steps so the heart is involved when do you make the determination that okay you don't have a heart attack and you're not going to die that's a great question. So once a patient, first place, you know, if we really suspect a heart attack, we're going to draw blood tests in the hospital, cardiac enzymes are called, and we're going to make sure that those are normal. Mm-hmm. If those are normal, then the next step is often the patient will have a stress test to make sure that there's no abnormality that, that suggests that they have obstruction of blood flow in the heart. Again, we might do an echocardiogram to make sure that there's no either heart dysfunction or valve dysfunction that could cause shortness of breath. And at that point, once everything else is negative, then the patient will go home. But then, at that point, the next step is where do they go next if they continue to have symptoms? Yeah, and now, it, it, this still falls under the umbrella of a dysautonomia, is that correct? Well, the, uh, ultimately, so those patients will ultimately come to me, 
And part of my evaluation before I even see the patient is I have them fill out a questionnaire. And one of the greatest things in terms of figuring out if they have a dysautonomia is actually getting this questionnaire and looking at it. And basically, I cover heart symptoms, but I also cover GI symptoms, urinary symptoms, neurologic symptoms. Do they have migraine headaches? Do they have urinary symptoms? Do they have too much sweating? Do they have not enough sweating? Mm -hmm. Do they have problems sleeping? And I take this inventory, and then I look at it, and it basically it's a paper um, form at this point. And when I look at it before I even go in the room, when they've checked off every box, I know that they probably have a dysautonomia. Because, probably because it involves so many of the systems. Exactly. Now, w w as a trained cardiologist, let's say you, you rewind the clock, you go back to school. Do they tell you what you do when you have multiple systems that are automatically involved with the heart, or, or what? So that's a great question. First place. None of this is taught in medical school, none of this is taught in cardiology, none of this is taught in, in really in medicine. Still not taught? To this day. And I, I talk to my residents all the time when I see them and I say, is anyone talking about this? They say, no one, no one teaches this stuff. So the thing is, is that the, the key concept is most people don't have time to ask all the other questions. So they don't know the patient's having stomach issues and they're, they're having urinary issues and they're having sleep issues, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that if you focus just on the heart symptoms, once you've done all the evaluation that we do for the heart symptoms, you're basically finished because you say, I've done everything and there's nothing more I can do for you, so you need to go find somebody else to help you. But the thing is, if you look at these other systems and you realize it's a pattern going on that they have all of these other issues going on together, mm -hmm. that's when it becomes clear that they may have an autonomic disorder and that's when I do a further workup. So we're, we're, I, don't, I don't want to use the word failure, but if the system needs to be corrected, does the 15-minute office visit need to be one of those areas that needs to be corrected? Because I'm hearing from so many doctors that it really is that patient history is really, really key. The history is the most important part of this entire thing. Testing is just sort of supporting what you feel based on the history, but the problem is the 15-minute exam, my, my 15 minute exams are usually 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. <laughs> which really well, makes a dent on my schedule, but sure. it's very difficult because these patients are not simple. These patients are very complicated and they have multiple issues that they're dealing with. Yeah, yet don't they have the right to respect or expect that they're gonna get the kind of care that helps them identify with it? Apart from the people who come in and demand and say, I know I've got a heart problem, blah, 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 blah. No, they absolutely do. It's just a matter of resources and time. So I think a lot of a lot of these patients come in, and I, you know, and what I do, I expect them to be a relatively long visit, and I schedule it, or I try to schedule it appropriately, so I'm not yeah. running too late for my next patient. But it takes a lot of patience to do what I do because you have to sit and you have to listen, and a lot of these patients have had issues going on for 5, 10, 15, 20 or more years. Mm -hmm. So they want to tell you their whole story from the beginning. So what yeah. I've learned over time is how to try to direct them. So I bring them to sort of to today, present, and see, see what's going on now. But it's important to hear some of these old stories because they may have been fainting since they were a child or they may have other issues involved. As they say, we've heard one doctor say the proof is in the pudding. So the pudding is that you've been now evaluating people differently based on what you know is, is the proof there that it works in terms of, yes, we are discovering what these people really have? Absolutely. I think, because, well, the proof in the pudding is, is the fact that once, we, once, once I figure out what they have and I start treating them with the certain therapies, depending on what it is, most of them get better. Not all of them, but the majority of them will get, will get improvements, and that's, that's the important thing. And that's what people need to hear. Right. Now, what about, what about anything that deals with a heart and uh, it not working properly as a function of age? Do we see this more in younger people, in teenagers, uh, adults, what? So if it truly is a heart issue, there is certainly more heart issues as we get older. Either with atherosclerosis, we get blockages in the blood vessels, we can have heart valve uh, dysfunction, we can have high blood pressure, we can have heart dysfunction, congestive heart failure, and things like that. Yeah. So all of those things I'm evaluating for along the way to make sure that they don't have an organic heart problem, meaning a heart, an actual heart problem. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do they right, just yeah. have the symptoms, or are they actually having an actual heart problem, in which case I'm going to treat that part of it as well. Yeah, so uh, a couple of last things we want to do. Number one, talk to doctors. What do they need to know as a cardiologist? Well, one of the most important things is to ask the questions. Sometimes it opens up a Pandora's box, but really, yeah. you really want to know if they're having other issues. Are they having other symptoms? And do they have, in particular, there are other related disorders. For example, um, as far as gastrointestinal disorders, patients will have um, functional gastroparesis where they'll, they'll, they'll eat food and get full very easily, or they can only eat small meals. 
they have a lot of nausea, vomiting, they may have irritable bowel syndrome, yeah. they may have migraine headache disorders, they may have interstitial cystitis, which is a urinary disorder. There's all kinds of these other related disorders that all fall under the same umbrella because it's the same underlying cause that's causing the problem. Right, yeah. And so I think that, number one, it's important to at least find out if they're having other things. One of the other things that's very important, and at least in my, in my practice, is finding out if the patients, and this is a question the patients often find odd, but a lot of the patients who have, um, you've probably heard today of POTS, or postural orthostatic oh, yes, tachycardia yes, yeah, syndrome. Sure. So a lot of those patients have um, a disorder underlying called hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Right. And so if you ask the patients if they're double jointed, um, and or if they've had multiple uh, joint dislocations or joint issues, yeah. Surprisingly, a lot of them will tell you yes, and you'll, oh you, then you can fo follow a different pathway because those patients are very susceptible to having autonomic dysfunction. Yeah. So it's very important to ask these questions that seem bizarre, but they actually are related to what's going on with the patient. Yeah, great. Doctor, thank you so much for your time, and good luck in your practice. Oh, Appreciate my pleasure. You. Thank you very much.